And let's get straight into our first panel discussion. An interesting one at this hour. In today's data rich environment, to be truly loved, brands have to go beyond mechanical connection to a more personal level. To discuss more on the topic, brand love going beyond algorithms, we have an eclectic panel of speakers to discuss this topic. So warm welcome first to our session chair. Please welcome Mr. Ruhail Amin, Senior Editor, Exchange for Media Group, and also our panelists, please welcome Amit Setia, Head Marketing, Siska Group, Milan Patak, Chief Business Officer, Root Mobile, Mr. Narayan Sundararaman, Head of Marketing, Bajaj Auto, Mr. Nicholas Contraplus again, Asia Pacific Regional Head of Marketing, Adobe DS Commercial, and of course, Simran Basin, Vice President for Brands and New Ventures, Licious and over to you, Ruhel, for this very interesting brand love going beyond algorithms. Thank you, Mitin. Thank you uh, for being there. And uh, welcome to my, uh, welcoming all my panelists here uh, on this first panel, uh, which is about brand love and how do we look beyond the number game and uh, build that essential emotional connect uh, I want to dive down straight uh, into the discussion and uh, I would uh, come to you first, uh, 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 Smiran, uh, to you first, uh, the only lady on the panel. Uh, Jimmy, uh, we are dealing with, uh, we have spoken so much about data and uh, we have taken it as the, if I may use the word, holy grail of uh, marketing to an extent that uh, nothing, no conversation is complete without referring to big data and uh, algorithms. So tell me in all of this, uh, where does the emotional connect, uh, I mean, where does it go? How do we build emotional connect when we are data driven, uh, when, when numbers are the only thing that we see? This is the perspective I want to get from all of you starting uh, with you, Smeran. Thank you so much, uh, Rohail. Um, firstly, excited to be a part of this panel um, and to listen into what everyone has to say. Uh, Nicholas, that was a wonderful session. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Rohail, I just, I just wanted to sort of start off with this. You've talked about you know, the data-driven world, um, but I think the world of brands um, is, uh, um, is, is one that uh, cannot work without any human connection, right? Um, and I think the only way uh, the two can coexist is that when you look at data, you try and understand the human connection and the human reasons behind the numbers, right? All numbers tell us a story, right? And if you're going to try and infer only from numbers what is happening without have understanding the story behind it or uh, uh, the reasons behind it, um, you would be reading the data completely wrong, right? And I think that's what separates um, uh, you know, separates a good decision from a, uh, from a great decision, right? Data can give us some wonderful points, right? But uh, how we read and what we put by them, uh, the fact, um, you know, that we dig into our own uh, gut, all 22 feet of it, uh, is as important as the numbers that are staring us uh, through our reams and reams of Excel sheets. Right. Right. And uh, Ryan, uh, to you, uh, my question that uh, if I uh, want to understand your brand uh, positioning and strategy of dealing with data and yet remaining uh, that emotionally, you know, uh, available to your customers, how do you build, bring these two uh, different uh, things together uh, in your approach? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rohel. So um, I think you know, we're inundated with data. And uh, my um, experience and uh, uh, over the last few years, especially in a category which I call assets, like, you know, motorcycles are, is that a lot of this data is a lot of noise. Uh, so in order to, you need to keep certain frameworks and certain principles uh, in mind if you're, you know, sort of have to float uh, and swim in the sea of data rather than sink in it. And for me, there are two things. I think one is you need to listen very carefully. Uh, and I think the second is it's very important to 
bounce off from this data and convert them into meaningful insights and how uh, you know what you listen um, how does it relate to you know what actually the customer is maybe feeling or maybe trying to communicate to you because data at the end of the day is a set of signals and uh, you know each day the number of signals that we pick up is um, you know fast expanding it is limitless i mean it just require as the cost of storage goes down the amount of data goes up but i really struggle to find a lot of value uh, in the sort of a linear way in which a lot of uh, you know data scientists so to say talk about it uh, so in short i would i mean i still um, uh, go back to the fundamentals of you know do we have good insights coming out of this data can we build a story um you know that can talk to us as well as talk to the customers and then act on it and i am i'm you know at the end of it it could be a judgment call it could be a gut call whatever you call it but it has to be on the basis of some strong facts uh, and insights right uh, nicholas coming to you uh, narayan raised uh, a point that you don't hear very often that uh, now most of the data is noise at times and we are just obsessed with it you know and also in my earlier conversation when i was trying to understand this topic and talking to my panelist uh, i raised another point that you know we need not broad brush the conversation around data that every sector finds it at as relevant as maybe uh, the big social platforms one do you agree uh, nicholas that uh, there is noise in the data in the numbers how do you avoid that noise first of all and secondly can we broad brush the concept of data that it applies uh, likewise across sectors or is it different in different sectors i i think it's a great question and and uh, i really am uh, excited to be on this panel with such a uh, great talent actually so uh, the um yeah in terms of uh data the, obviously yeah without a doubt i agree there's so much data out there we're swimming in it and and and, and it's only going to continue to increase uh, i i think it's important that we as you know brands need to look at how we become that signal in the noise for customers so that they they're able to find us because as we said there's a lot of signals a lot of noise out there uh for them you know when they're trying to find answers to their question and if we cut back to my earlier talk this is this not idea of brand utility i'm talking about is how do you create a positive signal that cuts through the noise for those customers looking for uh, solutions to the problems that they are either aware or not aware of yeah that's the challenge for each of us certainly me as a marketer that's what i'm trying to do when i look at the content i'm creating and 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 how i'm pushing that out there i want that to be a signal for other marketers to to zero in on so i think that's the same challenge for all of us in this panel today and the companies we're working for is how do we become that signal because if you become that signal it's a lot harder for you to find your customers and and have them come to you yeah there's it because they there that's where you ultimately have the ultimate pull marketing uh working in your favor you know they they're searching you out so i i don't know if my um, the fellow panelists would agree with that but that's sort of how i would look look at it mm. right right uh amit uh, uh, in in tell me your i mean uh, how is your brand positioning as far as uh, data is concerned and the algorithms are concerned and uh, how do you inter uh, get those insights uh, into an emotional messaging so uh, first of all thank you so much for having me here and i completely agree with what naran actually mentioned you know as far as data is concerned see we marketers love to make at times i think you know things very complex just because we want to believe that we have done something really meaningful i think that is a honest confession uh, but when you look at the whole story of this brand uh, siska so not like we never had data right the data was always around but beyond data what we had was a strong customer insight see data can always uh, you know always help you to give insights but there is always this small uh, you know percentage possibility of error that might happen because ultimately data gives you more of assumption as well because you are assuming basis your data right but because you have a strong customer insight i think we were able to really position the brand uh, so strongly in this country 
and 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 uh, you know the insight was about uh, you know saving money because uh, in india you know when it is about saving money everybody gives you a lot of attention <laughs> you know and i think that is what the fundamental benefit of uh, led as a product is right so while i know i'm charging comparatively a, a, a higher amount compared to other lighting devices but because i'm talking saving in the long run uh, you know people are able to believe in my storytelling that is what even nicolas mentioned right a strong compelling story needs to be narrated and i think that is how we have been able to position cisca um, you know from the last 5 uh, to 6 years beautifully so i think yes i agree again uh, on this very uh, discussion topic that uh, data is important but how much of data is important is also very important to be considered because uh, it might lead to something maybe which is not really the the true picture of your customer i want to come to you milind uh, to understand the marketer's mind here you know are marketers actually obsessed with numbers alone or where do em- the customer emotions figure uh, in your uh, estimation when do you talk to your friends in the community uh, so uh, let me try and take a slightly different take on both the top points right the data and the brand experience which nicolas so beautifully put in his uh, presentation by the way nicolas great uh, fantastic would love to get that uh, with that presentation and look at it please you just breeze through it uh so i'm trying to uh, articulate my, my point with one small experience everybody in the conference would experience right we wake up every morning we put our food down the bed and we try and wear a slipper now the experience of having the web of a slipper between your thumb and the first finger is absolutely intuitive to all of us right i have never worn a slipper which has that web on the third and the fourth finger has anybody worn i don't think so but now not in the morning <laughs> not yet <laughs> not in the morning yeah no right <laughs> now 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 imagine the job of a product guy who developed that insight saying the most convenient slipper will be between the thumb and the first experience for me experiences are so subliminal and within the brand philosophy and ethos that you forget that it is an experience and that in itself is an experience and if you look at great brands like apple they have made see there are two things the way i classify as experiences great brands who unleash experiences mm. and good brands who manage experiences mm. i believe great brands are always unleash experiences which are so subtle that a consumer does not even know that oh i am experiencing such tight convenience another great brand that i want to take an example is say paytm and you know i might be biased because i worked with that brand for 3 4 years but the transfer of money is so seamless that you expect oh it's my birthright to be experiencing that experience and that for me is a great experience let's take another example apple i think it came somewhere in 90s early 90s when the first laptop came and macbook came somewhere in mid 2000 2005 2006 at that point in time right i wonder if steve jobs had cdps and um, and and uh, dmps to his uh, to his passion points to try and analyze millions of data to point to emite or oh, customers needed simplifications of laptops i thought he went on sure consumer experience right uh, so i think while data is critical i think we sometimes overrate it what is very very critical for me is that subliminal experiences that i'm able to deliver for a brand right and i have been forefront of sales marketing bd for almost 20 25 years in my life right great sales guys are not the guys who sell great products great sales guys are the guys who solve problems hmm. i think problems are solved always by insights and and and, and experiences right? and i love the example what nicolas gave us in a pot right i don't think they picked up from anywhere else i think they just went on building and they made that experience as a default of experience at an airport Hmm. and that's why they unleashed a great airport in itself right and you'll find this brand after brand right and now we as perhaps students of this domain now we look at them and say oh this is how they did it right but the art and science of that is going through the experience and maybe modeling little bit here and there on insights that derive out of the market we all know uh, uh, we all know whether it's a television whether it is a print whether it is uh, digital right you work on statistical uh, elements of the nearest 
Prince yeah. cut and pull that you want to touch, right? You really don't do every consumer. Our holy grail of marketing is personalized communication to 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 every consumer in the world. Um, but you always run it on a statistical proximity of that audience group, right? Uh, so I think for me, data is important for that statistical probability. Great. Uh, but what really, 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 really matters is who is thinking to make the experience of the brand so subliminal that the consumer does not even know that it is a great experience, and he takes it like his birthright and a way of life. Great, I think very valid point raised. Uh, I think we we all agree to what you've said. Um, uh, coming quickly to you uh, back, uh, Sameer and. Uh, is there a way, is there a strategy that we can look at, you know, that can combine numbers with emotions? Uh, are we close to it? Uh, uh, do you think, uh, um, I mean, uh, marketeers can rely on uh, numbers alone to create that emotional connect? Is there a formula, is there a science to building numbers, combining numbers and emotions? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and I'm going to take... Um... Uh, I'm going to take Licious's example here, right? When um, uh, Abhay and Vivek, uh, the co-founders, set out uh, almost six years ago now uh, on this. Uh, see, the numbers part comes from the opportunity, right? Um, you have a large, uh, um, you have a category um, and, and you have a large size population and you understand what your consumption uh, in the market is and you know you've got a large size opportunity and that's your big data telling you that this entering this category is making business sense, right? Um, now there are multiple choices as to how you enter that category, right? What kind of a brand do you build? How do you position it, right? What is the reasons you give consumers to connect with you, right? And that's the part where if you miss out on the emotion there, right, you will lose a very powerful opportunity to begin your journey on the road, uh, connecting with brand love, right? And here, I think they started with a, um, a very, very simple credo, um, right? Uh, their passion for meat and their love for meat is where their journey and, and their shared uh, sort of connection began on the journey with Licious. And uh, um, I think as they started sort of understanding, uh, you know, what the opportunity out there is, uh, some very simple tenets is, is what sort of held uh, Licious in good stead and will continue to do so in the future, right? And these are all the emotional aspects of it, right? Uh, and one very important one that I think all of us live by every single day is that we will not sell what we cannot feed to our own families, right? Mm -hmm. Now there's no number to this, right? All our families are what, four in number, right? Two kids and uh, uh, you know two adults. Uh, and that, that's not an algorithm to go by, but it's a very simple, Tenet that helps each one of us uh, sort of filter every single decision that comes in saying that, is this the right decision that will deliver the output of a great quality product that I would be comfortable uh, sort of feeding my family? And I think uh, for me, since the time I've come on board Licious, um, I've realized it's simplified decisions so much, right? Uh, whether you look at products, um, whether you're looking at how you're going to take communication out there, um, uh, you know, I mean, is, is this, is, am I going to be comfortable feeding my daughter this? And the answer comes immediately. And I think that instinct as a human being comes sort of far, uh, uh, far faster and easier as, as, uh, as a member of the family, as a parent, right? Um, and it's really sort of driven all our decisions to a point where, um, you know, we've, I would say one of the really interesting things that I've realized in Licious is, Beyond the reams and reams of data, you know, customer calls that are coming in, feedback emails that are coming in and so on and so forth. Um, there's a very simple system where we decided we need to know, even if there's one person out there who is experiencing something a certain way and that experience is not uh, optimal and they're not happy about it, uh, we need to know about it. But how do you get millions of consumers to talk to you, right? And it, because by and large, I mean, consumers, if you're happy, you don't say anything because you're expecting a brand to make you happy, right? When you're not happy, you're still not saying anything. When you do actually call up customer care or send them that email to write about a bad experience, you reached a level that is so high, you're so, so upset and annoyed 
that you have taken that extra effort to actually go figure out the customer care number and email ID and take time out to send feedback in, right? That's already right. a tool, right? Huh? And a very simple section where all employees today, if any experience, either we have personally experienced with our products or any friend and family member who's more likely to call us, right? Or send us a message and say, hey, Simran, there was something wrong with your product today. You know, I just didn't like this experience, right? And uh, we feed it in to uh, an email called uh, voiceatlicious.com, right? And that goes to every senior manager within the company, including the co-founders, right? And gets picked up, gets analyzed immediately uh, because it may be one, it may be one data point uh, in terms of one consumer that's had that experience. They, but there could be hundreds and thousands who have simultaneously had a similar experience. So if we can fix that one, we know we are anticipating proactively and, and right. creating um, you know, an experience, uh, improving it before it becomes this big volley that it actually reaches you. Because by the time it gets picked up in research, it's already too late. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, not taking customers so lightly. I mean, reaching out, listening, and proactively trying to understand them. Absolutely. I think these are an another, uh, this can the layer of understanding to the numbers. Uh, Nicholas, to you, uh, you, know, uh, you know, with this deluge in data, uh, give me your sense of how can technology help marketeers make uh, their strategies more uh, pointed, you know? and uh, perform uh, and their campaigns or their brands can perform better. What is your advice to marketers? Well, t first advice, which is going to sound counterintuitive for everyone here, for uh, I'm a marketer represents a technology company, but te technology alone will not solve all your problems. Yeah? I think this is the God's honest truth. And when I talk to leaders, I always say this, um, an actual fact, I've actually refused to sell my software to uh, businesses that don't really understand what they're trying to solve in terms of problems, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, they, they, the project will fail. You really need to look at people, process, and technology. And I know it sounds cl cliche, but I think we've heard that today, you know, uh, from the various panelists that it's really important that we think about how we harness that data and, and ultimately the insights you get require a human input, a human element, you know, of interpretation, you know, and, and, through that interpretation will come, you know, the creative that will lead to the campaign that ultimately the creative idea that will lead to a campaign that ultimately will drive people to a website or to a store. So you need to bring your people processes and technology. How do I get aggregate that data across all organizations? So that's, then you got to look at knocking down the, the internal silos that exist inside an organization and, you know, marketing and sales and customer service have to come together and unify uh, themselves around what they're trying to achieve. So I really say to people, start with looking at um, how you can bring, you know, the different stakeholders that are going to be needed uh, together around the table. Obviously, uh, make sure you've got the right people, you're hiring the right people that can actually um, power that decision making process. And without a doubt, don't, I'm not downplaying technology, it's going to be the difference between your, um, you know, your success or failure in terms of the types of technologies you bring together to, to ultimately translate, um, you know, the, the, you know, to deliver on those insights that enable you to address those uh, experience gaps that you might have. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of technology, people and process, but with that technology, I mean, you know, obviously the world's going through a pandemic at the moment, you know, with a lot of the markets shutting down, staying in touch and in communication with your customers and prospects at scale is actually something that's um, been quite important. You know, a lot of the brands that didn't maybe have that, you know, direct digital engagement uh, have been left exposed in not being able to have that ongoing uh, uh, you know, engagement. I, what we saw in our customer base is brands that had really invested in, in having the technologies that enabled them to communicate and stay in touch at scale have really ultimately had a, have been able to, to, to navigate the challenges a lot more easier. But like I said, it's, it's, it's those three elements coming together. That will drive the transformation, people, process, and technology. Um, it will help drive transformation, not just technology on its own, yeah. Narayan, uh, earlier in my the earlier answer, you went, I mean, it was very interesting to hear you bust certain myths about data. Tell me more about the next layer um, of your conversation that where does data belong in this entire marketing approach? Have we overwhelmed ourselves with the power of data? Uh, 
what is the right approach to take to look at data in your view it's an interesting uh, question i think uh, it depends on uh, you know what two things i think which category you are talking about and uh, also uh, what's your business model uh, look if your business model depends on 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 data then i think you should really really take it very very seriously when i say your business model Uh, what does it depend on i mean at the end of the day as uh, amit was saying i mean you're selling cisco at the end of the day right you're selling a set of products i ultimately we sell a range of bikes we expect uh, a customer to buy a bike he's not buying data um, so i think it is very important to stay true and do stuff which is uh, you know relevant to the category in which you operate and combine it with what drives your business uh i think for a lot of the e-commerce uh, players um you know platforms or social media platforms they thrive on data and for them uh, uh, i'm guessing more data is actually better uh i think the watch out as far as uh, you know businesses like uh, uh, say a bajaj auto is concerned where we are selling motorcycles is not to sort of get overwhelmed by all of this and uh, i also have this uh, theory that uh, you know uh, all of us have now been educated with a, what i call a very engineering uh, framework in mind our belief from the time you know we've been in school it's always matricized you know there's a score the score tells you how bright you are the score tells you whether you get to a certain you know college or not so i think we've we we feel very easy and comfortable with it and therefore this innate sort of belief that you know data can tell you everything uh, but uh, life is not about data i mean life and you know for example for most of our customers uh who buy commuter bikes or uh, three wheelers uh life has been very tough in the last one year now if you can imagine uh, and i have a slightly contra view to 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 nicolas and uh, in this that uh sometimes i think it is better not to sort of reach out to customers uh, currently if my customers are going through a period of pain and their sentiment is not very low self so sending them a sales message or sending them a bright cheery branding message or you know a very rara come by me because i'm you know sort of got a great discount is not correct because the the, the entire environment and the sentiment of purchase thrives on posit- positivity right buying something is uh, whether we like it or not is a very consumerist and uh, you know it's 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 celebrated i mean people who buy bikes or uh, say three wheelers are are committing a very significant portion of their income streams to to that purchase and for them it's a very big thing uh, you know and if currently the context is that you know they are not sort of in the uh, you know having a great time in their lives i really question whether you know marketers need to reach out at this point in time so i'm a, i'm 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 not completely in sync with that i think you need to be in tune with how your customers relevance is very important sentiment is very important uh, in 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 categories and you know right now for a lot of the e-commerce players i think it is uh, it is uh, absolutely the right time to reach out to your customers so i don't think it's one size fits all i think to answer your question a lot depends on the category that you operate in and more importantly what's your business model i think you need to be crystal clear about that yeah i just i want to definitely jump in and i agree 100% with your your uh, sentiment there i i think it's more around um again you said it really well knowing your customers and and that and the market segment you're in but being able to stay in touch with relevant information and certainly not selling uh, i agree 100% on that when you're going through a dark time but more again it like through that notion of providing a service proposition you know utility you know so and a, and a different avenue for them to connect i think you know if they if they're not able to to meet so some of our customers they didn't have the ability to physically meet with their customers anymore so therefore the 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 connection through the digital channels became important because they customers still wanted to engage so that i agree 100% with you you need to that's where the marketer needs to use their smarts and understanding that it's not about selling at this point in time it's about serving yeah 100% thanks for that point i i think it was a very good point to call out so yeah thank you and uh, my personal favorite uh, is your you know when you are trying to address the obsession with numbers that we are you know kind of groomed uh, to grow with and we're still maybe obsessed with it but i'll 
I'll, I'll talk to you later on that. Uh, Amit, uh, to you, uh, tell me, how do you uh, listen to uh, um, customers, you know, at, the, at Cisco? First, uh, we are looking beyond algor algorithms. We are looking beyond data. It's, a customer is not just a number, you know. How do you ensure that you're listening to your customers and uh, understanding their needs? What all do you deploy technology or wh what are the different methodologies that you use? So I'll answer this question, Ruhel, in uh, three parts. First is, I think a lot is being spoken about data and uh, we all respect data, we all want data, but I think uh, it's very important for us to be uh, honest about as to what we are trying to really prove, you know, because this whole, uh, you know, function marketing is now stressed highly because of the fact that we are chasing ROI. You know, everybody wants results to happen in no time in marketing. Uh, more or less the, uh, the, the nature of engagement is transactional, right? I think these are the hard realities of what we end up doing uh, either knowingly or unknowingly. You know, I'm just keeping this open-ended because we have a lot many categories which are represented in this panel discussion, but somewhere, this keeps us under a lot of pressure, right? So I think that is wherein uh, it is very important to, you know, really keep few things really away from data. Now, this is where I am answering your second part, which is about what we do in Cisco. So one, one right. part is obviously the data which we have spoken at length right now, but the second part is, uh, you know, is, is, is your offering is able to cut through what is being required genuinely and organically by the customers, right? Because I want to sell you something and you have to buy is not going to work. And, and more so in this category, imagine, which is almost like a commodity. A bulb is a bulb is a bulb. At the end of the day, it's a bulb, right? And it has got no organic engagements. Like imagine all of you guys, you will not even remember how many bulbs are there in your own, own home? What all brands are you guys using? what all voltages these products are actually representing within your house, right? Nobody's aware about it, but everybody wants to talk great things about it, right? And that is where the whole importance comes that while your data is talking and backing you up, you need to also go and check the ground reality by talking to your customers, right? Um, I remember uh, there were a lot of interesting programs that we did, you know, in uh, example, we had the Cisco Your Home, Cam your home Campaign where we actually went to the customers, like not the customers, but the prospects, right? And we actually spoke to them. Uh, we had our own technical devices in place, which actually showed them as to, you know, if, uh, you know, they replace their existing, uh, you know, lighting devices by any LED, I'm not plugging Cisco, by, by any LED product, what kind of saving will come to them, right? And, and they were able to believe that whole experience because it was happening right in front of their eyes. And this is something which is very, very credible, right? So it's not only about saving money, which is obviously the bigger proposition, but also the experience that we created. And I think these are some of the very key things that we adopted you know, way back uh, when we started the journey because of which uh, we became today what we became, right? So I think that's where the magic lies uh, that, you know, you need to have a great insight. You need to go and talk to your customers and, uh, and be honest. <laughs> I think that's more important. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I know Mr. Narayan has a, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> hard stop at four o'clock. I want to come to you before I come to Milan. Uh, but Narayan, tell me, you know, there is another thing happening that uh, machines, though, though we know are not great at reading emotions, but uh, there is a concept that algorithms are being designed to understand and predict emotions through, of course, right now they are not doing a great job because they depend on facial expressions which human beings, of course, can mask. Tell me in future, do you see algorithms, you know, uh, itself uh, understanding, becoming emotionally intelligent as well? Sorry, your audio is muted. Uh, I was saying that just hearing that was I was uh, going back to several science fiction novels that I've read about, uh, you know, I think uh, Philip K. Dick and Arthur C. Clarke and the rise of the Minority machines, etc. Et Minority Report from Tom Cruise also is the same. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. So look, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, I, I think we, we all will be more surprised at 
how dumb artificial intelligence and machine learning is right now compared and yeah maybe it has great potential etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, you know and that's where i think it is i have i mean the, it shows a lot of promise uh, and a lot of potential but i don't think it's been actualized at present now in the future and let me boil it down to say uh, very sharply into uh, say marketing and communication development world right i think a few years ago or i read an article saying that there's a japanese agency which had where you know they'd replace the creative directors with uh, with some kind of an artificial intelligence algorithm and i don't know what happened so i was reading this story and i was talking to my agency uh, partners and my you know my friends in the creative department and if i just sort of look back at the end of the day i think it will still be in the in the reams of science fiction i think the ability for humans to sort of connect with others um, and understand uh, and then translate that to something that the other persons can sort of relate to uh, is a very uniquely human um, human ability uh, so uh, i i think it will take a long long time for this to be replicated completely Uh, there's always the chance that may happen that something good will come out of it but um, uh, if i was to understand your question right i don't see an algorithm completely replacing all elements of the marketing system uh, certainly uh, you know when you have to rec- where you have to recognize patterns where you know you have data regarding behavior that customers or uh, people uh, are uh, you know uh, exhibiting they are sending out signals i think spotting those patterns absolutely and what is sort of known as a kind environment i think uh, uh, i can expect the algorithm to really do a very good job but you know the minute it comes to unkind environments as they call it where things may be very volatile where things will be very uncertain you, you know don't know how um, uh, you don't know how uh, people's reactions will be uh, or they may change uh, i i think uh, human intervention will or human uh ability will always trump an algorithm uh with right. regards to the creative process perfect thank you so much i know you have a hard stop at 4 uh, uh thanks for joining us today yeah i'm uh, sorry to cut out but i have a very uh, i have a meeting that i need to attend so it was great uh, meeting all of you uh, my co panelists and uh, thank you ruhel uh, i'll thank be you signing so much. out now right. and uh, i want to thanks uh, mirin your thoughts on this uh, uh can the coming together of uh, can this puzzle be sorted if you have the you know algorithms and the emotional intelligence merged into one so um if i have to really crystal ball gaze i think yes i think the issue is time um if 50 60 70 years ago somebody would have said oh you can carry a phone um anywhere uh, from india to us and just speak seamlessly with any person anywhere in the world maybe people would have laughed at the idea saying oh, oh come on you need a you need a physical line you need a dial up connection and so on and so forth right um if somebody would have said oh am i going to send a human to a mars some day people would have said yeah maybe possible maybe not right so it, for me it's given uh, perhaps that uh, if not this day some day uh, artificial intelligence and um, the robotic uh, designs would mimic humans as as much possible certain elements like uh, deep human emotion uh, facial expressions maybe still early maybe it will take 100 years 200 years but eventually uh, things will come right uh, we ourselves are in a communication space and we ourselves actively work on processes and technology which replace humans uh, what i mean is let's take a simple example of a contact center solution right uh, all of us as brands have contact centers uh, when the first call comes Uh, to the completion of the transaction or a customer query request or a complaint you have a very high probability that you are completely automating that process as much possible on the uh, digitized uh, voice record ivr as they call it uh, with trying to prevent the ability to or the need to pass it to a human live agent right so as much possible you want to complete the transaction there and there itself on the platform right now this is nothing but a a digitized form of some kind of a machine learning or some kind of an intelligence which is non human in a way right uh, i agree with narayan that on certain areas uh, the evolutions are early uh, but i think we will evolve uh, and become more and more sharp right 
uh, mind you i'll also give a context to uh, context to certain human element right while technology is very critical and there are chances of we being uh, we being replaced uh, at active work scenario by robots does exist right but look at india right we are such a unique country you go to nariman point in any building you have a lift or as they call it elevator but then you have a lift man sitting outside whose job is to pick you up from a ground floor and take you to every floor around there now this is very unique to india right uh, i think human interventions will never be removed but the possibility of certain tasks being robotized is very very high and that's for me is a clear win for an artificial intelligence that you don't make humans redundant uh, but you try and remove some tasks so that you still make humans relevant in some other area right i hope i have been able to give you a perspective on both but as far as india is concerned imagine if tomorrow someone comes and says oh you know 60% of your population is going to be replaced with with robots there will be social riots because how will you feel these right so you have to be very careful uh, uh, you have to be very careful of a evolution of the technology um evolution of um uh, our race as it goes along using some of these technologies and and one has to be really really careful it has to solve problems and the purpose of that is not replacement the purpose of that is augmentation and i think that has to be uh, clear and there are projects papers uh, research is being done on ethical use of artificial intelligence and so on so both i think that's something for some other topic but but i guess we need to be right. very right. part very very careful yeah absolutely so i have exactly 9 minutes i want to come with one round of questions first to you nicholas uh, you know in our earlier connect yesterday you raised a point around uh, you know beyond moving beyond personalization to individualization you know uh, yesterday uh, tell us more about it this sounds very interesting uh, give me a sense of what you meant by it and to all the panelists it's very cool in progress sorry the audio is muted yeah yeah sorry um so yes no um uh i think look delivering a personalized experience at scale now uh, is pretty much possible and a lot of people listening today would be doing this in their companies in terms of the way you know sending out emails with a first name etc and the analogy i'll use here though is you know i'm a regular flyer or was before the pandemic you know i i fly with singapore airlines or other airlines and and you when you when you have a a you you know you're part of the, the 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 their programs you get given a card and then when you arrive at the plane they will say hey mr contopolis welcome back great to have you on the plane and and then guide you to your seat and that, and and that feels very lovely it's nice it's like oh they recognize who i am and they're acknowledging me but they'll do the same message to everyone else behind me that's also a member you know you know has status yeah that's a great example of personalization at scale it's not really unique it's the same message the same experience being delivered it's just gives you that sort of momentary uh feeling of you know nice importance i guess what would individualization look like in the same scenario would it be them greeting me taking me to my chair and then having a happy birthday sign you know my favorite piece of cake and and you know champagne my favorite drop of champagne ready for me there that's individualization that is the individualization of an experience yeah and this is again the challenge now for us as marketers is how do we take that next level go beyond personalization to individualization um and this is again where the data and technologies elements do come together in how enabling us to do that you know that's what we need to be looking at but so yeah that's the new frontier for all of us is how do we individualize that you know our experiences our content um you know at scale uh so yeah does that help answer the question in terms of my thoughts on that absolutely absolutely, yeah. absolutely. um uh, uh, smeran to you um though you touched upon it uh, but i just want to hear once more you know what are the big emotional uh, motivators that brands can use to connect with con consumers beyond just sales you earlier referred to actively proactively looking at it and also one additional question my favorite what is the biggest marketing myth in your view the biggest marketing myth okay i'm going to come back uh, okay maybe i'll start with that uh, the biggest marketing myth is that uh, we marketers know what we're doing right we don't and i think that's why we're grappling with data 
And I'll tell you the, you know, the, the double-edged sword, uh, you know, aspect of working with data, trying to understand, uh, you know, where can I find some answers, right? Which direction do I go in? Um, is that, you know, we've talked so much about algorithm today, right? Um, the data is only reflecting the past, yeah? If you talk about predictive algorithms, predictions are happening based on something that's happened in the past, right? And that's the biggest problem that all of us marketers are dealing with is that we're all looking in the rear view mirror. When are we going to break through with something new if we are going to keep looking at data that's reflecting what's already happened in the past, right? And I, I don't think we've, we've talked about Apple here today. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the foremost, if it, research is not gonna get you that big idea out there. That is when you have to throw out the data and that's when you actually have to sort of open your mind and expand and think about sort of what are the possibilities that today I don't just, I, I just don't see happening, but you know, tomorrow I wish I could uh, sort of, um, you know, see it come to life and uh, throwing those crazy ideas out there um, or, or throwing sort of uh, um, uh, thoughts out there that connect human beings, right? Um, and, and I think one such connection, uh, you know, that, that I don't think started with the data point or an algorithm was perhaps something that all of us are, apologies, that's one of my three dogs, you're going to keep hearing this barking as I talk. But, um, you know, Facebook, right? I, I, I think it just started with the simple human emotion of staying connected. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not getting, getting into the backstory of sort of where it sort of uh, uh, other sort of reasons that uh, sort of uh, told its origin story, but uh, it was a, it's a simple connection. It's a human connection, right? Uh, you've also touched upon uh, Rohail and asked about what are the different emotions that marketers can use, right? Um, I think love is, uh, is a very powerful one, but uh, right on the other extreme, fear is an equally powerful one, right? Uh, uh, feeding on the fear of what would happen to your loved ones, for example, right? Uh, and insurance sort of works on that fear, right? Uh, so then there are many brands that work on both sides of the spectrum and are equally, uh, equally successful. And it depends on what category you're in and it depends on how you're positioning your brand and, and what's the why of your brand that you're selling, right? Uh, Nicholas spoke about uh, the why of a brand and how uh, I think Simon Sinek has beautifully brought that in a gold, uh, you know, through his golden circle uh, sort of philosophy. Um, right. but yes, choose your emotion. Uh, and choose right. it wisely uh, um, and choose an emotion that connects with your category, that connects with the consumer and connects with why you entered the business, right? And that's okay. when it becomes truly powerful, right? That's when brand love starts strengthening year after year uh, of staying connected with consumers. Perfect. Very well said. And quickly to you, Amit, your, uh, first tell me uh, what, is, what are the big emotion motivators that brands can use uh, you know, to connect with customers beyond numbers and sales. I think we have spoken a lot anyways, you know, regarding emotions also today. I think, uh, uh, I think uh, personally, the one that I really appreciate is the fact that, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you're able to, you know, create that aspiration, whatever emotions that you have to use, I think beyond that, I also look at what kind of aspiration I have to create for the customer. Uh, because I have worked across various categories, I mean, like right from steel to real estate to now consumer electronics, I think very, very diverse, right? I mean, like uh, in real estate, it was all about, you know, fear, you know, fear of losing out on the opportunity of a good price for the project, right? Today, it is about, um, uh, almost uh, getting into the vanity emotions wherein I am not only selling uh, regular uh, LED products, but I'm also selling smart LED products, which are actually talking to you. Uh, you are able to control these products with the help of an app or maybe with your voice assistant, right? So there's a lot of vanity also right. attached to, to these products. So I think it depends upon which category you are in and, you know, what exactly you want to create as an aspiration, I think. So I think that's where I'm Perfect. struggling, uh, you know, so far uh, across. Perfect. Perfect. And the marketing myth, I want to understand from you, what has been the biggest marketing myth for you? Okay. So a uh, marketing myth, I think um, uh, there's a myth about marketers that, you know, um, 
they 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 are not good with numbers or they fear sales i think that is a myth about marketers i don't agree to this because i think uh, looking at what we have been doing in this country i think you know because you know example uh, and that's being very candid you know if you go and generally talk about marketing uh, at least i think 10 to 15 years back that you know you say okay you are into marketing and uh, people used to say acha to kya bechte ho i think you know so that was the reaction at no. least i used to get initially you know from people because you know they think that you know you you can't sell things or maybe you're not good with numbers etc or, or you fear numbers i think that's a classic myth about marketers at least today now when we are dealing with so much of data when you spoke uh, that hindi word i can see nicholas smiling i know he understood it nicholas you're quick <laughs> on it <laughs> I, i'm assuming it was something like i was thinking about what i was told when i moved into marketing by my sales colleagues that you're moving into the coloring in department i don't know if that was closely uh close to that uh, uh but it, it is it was it, it was interesting to hear what you had to say uh, about the, the past uh, how marketers were perceived sorry what was the question um back to me was it uh, so one is uh, uh, building that emotional uh, what are the big emotional motivators that uh, brands can use uh, to to reach out to customers and second in your view what has been the marketing myth uh, oh okay Uh, those are tough ones. I, I would I would defer to what was already shared about the emotion. I mean, you need to. Learn, it, it is yes. very dependent on. And you answered industry. it. Yes, you answered it. Yes. yes yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, marketing myth. Oh, I. Oh God, that's a hard one. Um, it got it caught me off guard on that one. So myth. Um, I don't actually. I, I don't have one that springs to mind if I'm honest at the moment. So I might pass on that one. Actually, I think. um again we've had a really great conversation i i just want to say i i've learned a lot from today's session so i want to thank uh my panelists um there were some really great insights there and i look forward to hopefully meeting up with you guys in person at some point um I, yeah I, i think the virtual uh, the the physical the live events may hopefully might after the second vaccination everybody is waiting for it so uh, we're all waiting for the second vaccine and million final thoughts from your side uh, on building this uh, emotional uh, you know connect what are the emotional motivators sorry your audio uh so i think two things right um i think the emotional motivator uh, has always been satiation of a need in a way uh, and trust i would pick up trust as another very critical area, uh, area uh, whether it's an airline which promises you to deliver on time from one place to another transport uh, whether it's a payment gateway which says i will ensure that no transaction fails whether it's a biscuit which says every time you eat me the taste wouldn't change right so i think the trust of the experience of that brand i think is going to be one strong emotion uh, we have so far not used trust as a very strong emotion in most brands but i think as time progresses uh, people will start differentiating on trust as a factor uh your second question of myth uh, one of the funniest things i have always been very intrigued and i have never been able to do it when people come and told me oh you know what i create viral videos and i often wonder how can anyone create viral video <laughs> i don't I, i don't create viral video 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 becomes viral right like collaborate no one thought said oh i will create collaborate because i wanted to be viral across millions and millions of users right it's just wow. it's just it's something people pick up right so for me creation of a viral video is the biggest marketing myth which any marketer comes and right. tells me an agency comes and tells me oh my job is to create viral video as a thank you very much let's catch it <laughs> <laughs> but we are living in viral times actually metaphorically but well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today it's been great i wish we had more time but we're over short already uh, thank you everyone uh, for being there and sharing your valuable insights thank you thank you, thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. stay bye safe bye bye